Hi, my name is Melvin Way. Welcome to my YouTube channel. This is a video series. First episode about growing passion fruit from seed. So I got two organic off the vine passion fruits from a coworker, and I decided to try these fruits out, see what they taste like. To my surprise, they were full of seeds that were coated with some pulp, but there wasn't really much meat inside, so to speak. So I was uh, kind of bewildered as to what this would be like. Kind of expected it to be a little bit tart based on the smell, and that's exactly how it was. I'm just going to fast forward through this. Um, it's not that great in my opinion, but you know, if you're interested in growing this, um, definitely check out this video and the ones that are going to follow from this. But I didn't really know how to eat this, so I just ate the seeds whole with uh, slimy pulp surrounding them. It's kind of got a sharp, you know, tangy taste. Um, not really like citrus, but it's pretty acidic. So it's an interesting fruit. I've never had anything like that before, and I was wondering how I was going to get the pulp off the seeds. So I started doing this. Um, it wasn't that great in the beginning. You know, the seeds were still very slimy, so then you got to put them in a new paper towel and do that you know, maybe two or three times vigorously until you get seeds that are clean like this because if you have seed um, or fruit pulp all over your seeds, then that will rot. It's got a lot of sugar in there. But you never know. Maybe it's intended to go right in the ground with uh, the pulp. Maybe the acid protects it. I don't really know. So they're pitted like golf balls. Here's some macro footage. It's very interesting. Never seen seeds like this up close before. And this is my balcony. Uh, those are my seeds. And I'm going to use this old pot of dirt. But first I have to sterilize this because in seasons past, if you keep using the same stuff over and over again and you had any kind of a bug infestation before, then it's going to go badly. So I bought this new planter. It's got a lot of volume. And I put my seeds in this Pyrex container. So I'm going to add some hydrogen peroxide in there. Just a mild solution. It doesn't have to be 3%, but for a few minutes that will hopefully get rid of some of the bacteria and fungal spores that are you know, just waiting to grow because there's no doubt some residual fruit pulp on there. So I just want to wipe these a bit on the balcony for a really long time, pour some of that old dirt in there and pick out some of the larger chunks of debris, you know, um, twigs that are too big and whatnot, or just little rocks. And I'm basically going to bake this in the oven in hopes of sterilizing it. So it's a lot of work, but well worth it. Because if you don't do this, then you might have things like spider mites, a fungus gnats, and springtails just going crazy. You'll just have a population explosion of vermin. You also have bugs coming from the outside world sometimes too. So this sterilization is good. I'm going to do 425. I used to do 350 Fahrenheit which I think is, you know, 177 Celsius. So this is probably closer to 200 Celsius. And as you can see, it's caught on fire. It's just smoldering like that. It's sort of like a wildfire. And since this is mostly made of little fragments of wood, it has that wildfire smell. So I just splashed some tap water on it to try to put it out. I have never had this before, but it smoked up the entire apartment. And it took a long time for the smell to go away. So, yeah, just unpleasant. Don't do this and go outside for many hours. You know, never leave the oven unattended. And I didn't realize it would start smoldering at this temperature. I thought, you know, for instance, books would burn at 450 Fahrenheit or whatever. So 425 would be safe, but uh, I would continue with a 350 Fahrenheit 177 Celsius just to be safe so I sprayed enough water to put it out then put them back in the oven at a lower temperature to continue the sterilization process and I always have some nagging doubt that it doesn't work completely well so the watering tray still has a lot of water in it the pot is very heavy 
and we have six sprouts so far and we're off to a very good start so previously I had filled the bottom watering tray there's a lot of baked soil in there and after you bake it it becomes really really dry very hygroscopic so I was probably underestimating the amount of water I need you can see some cobwebs there spider is quite dumb you know as this thing gets bigger it's just gonna rip up the web so I don't know why a spider would bother just trying to organize its life around that plant you know, if you wreck a spider's web, it starves to death, and that wasn't a fully formed one. So that's a total waste of resources. I'm spraying some distilled water to water the very, very dry surface. And you can see there that seedling hasn't fully made it yet. Still has to kick off the seed coat. And here's just an overview of what's going on. Not very impressive, I know but hopefully we'll get some growth as time goes on. I only have six seedlings here, which is really too much even for a pot of this size because as you know, if you've been following my earlier series such as Honeydew or Charente Melons, the vines just quickly get huge. So these have waxy leaves. They're really different from, you know, the other melon vine leaves that I've had. So I just get the feeling that these will be a lot more healthy. I'm using a squirt bottle now. Hopefully that will improve things. You can, you can get a lot more water in the soil directly and still not disturb things. That's why I'm using spray bottles, squirt bottles, because I know at this very early fragile state, sometimes if you flood water from the top then everything goes topsy-turvy, especially if the soil is not... Uh, wet and cohesive then you know everything could just float around and then you'll disturb the root system whatnot and some of these will die so you can see some yellow leaves there uh, this is that closer to the edge of the pot that gets the sun so it's more shaded so the leaves look healthier there and this is one in the middle this one's doing the best so as you can see waxy leaves um, veiny as well so it's day 54, there's not much progress. Uh, soil is probably just still too dry despite me watering like this from the top and watering from the bottom where it won't cause a disturbance. Thinking of watering more because it's been, you know, what has it been, like three weeks since these sprouted. So I was thinking there's going to be a lot more progress than this. Other factor is there's just not a lot of sun these days. Since I started this series approaching winter, that's what happened, basically in the beginning of October. So it's day 55, there's rain pouring onto my balcony, lots of cold cloudy days. So my Joshua tree is much bigger now. And here you can see at the corner, you know, this really doesn't help the situation because a lot of melon vines, you know, with their fast growth, they need a lot of sun. So it's day 63, the soil looks dry again despite a few days of rain pouring onto my balcony. I'm just going to start flood watering from the top now that everything seems safe and secure. You know, they've reached a decent size. Um, you know, the one closer to where my pot is with the yellow leaves, that's, you know, finally kicked off its seed coat. So it looks a little sloppy like this, um, just as I predicted soil is too dry and once you do this stuff starts shifting around because the water doesn't readily absorb initially um, very deep in there so it's day 92 it's been a while and as you can see there's been a lot of growth um, I'm using my new smartphone camera to do this 4k video filming you can see a wrinkle in the leaf there well, two deformations basically I don't know where that came from you know maybe it was just because it was underwater for so long just sat in the sun and this middle individual is the most healthy and robust it's got you know what looked to be tendril primordia and whatnot still got its cotyledons they all do and the leaves are getting bigger and they're waxy and healthy looking so there's some clover there that's growing and you know at first I thought of getting rid of that but Later on I thought, well, it might help fix the soil. 
with its uh, nitrogen fixing bacteria or whatnot. Uh, provided that they're in there in the soil since I sterilized this and that could uh, enrich the soil. So this one died. I've lost one out of the six and it could just be due to positioning that spot had the most sun beating down on it and hence maybe it just dried up and just didn't get enough water. So it's day 100. It's been over three months and as you can see there's five individuals still but the one you know sort of on the right edge of the pot, you know, based on where I'm usually standing, that's uh, near the wall. That's almost dead. You had a new set of leaves come out after the cotyledons, but they're they're yellow. So there must be some kind of competition going on between the root systems. And there's only four left. You know, it's likely that the other one that's closer to the door, well, what you can partly see of a door, you know, that that's probably going to go too. So that would leave me with maybe three in the future. I'm just projecting. Yeah, this one. So it's not growing as fast. And this middle one has the best position. And just like in a chessboard, if you have something in the middle, it gets to interact with the greatest amount of resources. So it's going to be a winner. But it's also being crowded by the two others right near it. But three vines would be a good number to have. You know, five in one pot is just way too much. And I think these can self-pollinate anyway, so even if I only had one vine getting to the bot, you know, to the end, it would still be fine. It'd be a great result. And I don't know if I'm going to go that far, but I figured most people like the first episode the most. They just want to see how to get started. And I figured this time I would wait longer, hence the 100 days, for the first episode. So thanks for watching, and please stay tuned to my YouTube channel. You know, I haven't been producing a lot of content lately, but, you know, the economics of trying to run a YouTube channel have been getting harder and harder over the last few years. So thanks for watching. I hope you, this helps you get started with your passion fruit vine growing. Welcome back to my YouTube series on growing passion fruit from seeds. It's day 106. Check out my new plastic shower can that's got a 3 liter capacity. 1 liter roughly equals 1 quart. It's got this uh, detachable rubber shower head that makes it very easy to clean. And the flow is actually quite ample. The nozzle is transparent. I put plastic wrap over the top so I can store some distilled water in this and just go. So let me give it a whirl. I'm grabbing the handle from the top portion, although you'll probably want to grab it from the side. As when you get some experience with this kind of shower can, you'll realize that, um, you know, after you pour the first liter or so out of it, then you'll have to change the angle more and more. So it's very convenient. I need top watering for thirsty plants such as passion fruit vines. So I read earlier that they're vines, um, not anything like a sturdy bush, you know, that will have woody stems or bark anytime soon. At least I'm not giving that impression. So there might be a structure problem, but, you know, as for now, everything is growing relatively slowly in the vertical direction and the leaves have gotten big. I'm doing this flood watering. You can see the dead one there and the clover kind of behind the one in the center. So some are diverging in you know their growth speed compared to the others. And as you can see, there was a lot of air space in there. So when I uh, flood water from the top, it just kind of bubbles like that for a few seconds. I don't know if that will settle over time. I think it will. And the way I treated this soil uh, prior to starting the series was I baked it. So you can see that one over there towards the edge. That's not going to make it. You know, it's not really grown since my first episode. So it's day 121. Everything's slightly bigger, but the leaves are somewhat yellowish. I suppose that depends on, you know, my recording device and its interpretation at various angles and levels of light and so forth. But, you know, I got the impression that uh, over the last few weeks, I've had 
somewhat of a yellowing problem. Maybe I'm just not watering enough. This one gets blocked, uh, deprived of sunlight from the center one, which is much bigger. And there's this kind of matted clover that just spreads out in all directions. I've seen that in the wild. Maybe I can get some footage of that. And, you know, that one hasn't grown at all. So basically you have maybe four healthy ones. Yeah. And a clover that's doing well. And that's pretty much it. So I'm going to give it another shower. And I think this uh, watering can is working out really well. It's providing a lot of water uh, top down without um, disturbing all the soil as I did with my previous watering can, which was just metal and it started to rust and had a much smaller capacity, et cetera, et cetera. So this new watering can is superior in every which way. And yeah, it's basically just, you know, water more, wait and water some more. I haven't given a thought to fertilizer yet because I don't want to disturb things if nothing's going wrong at the moment, especially when everything's nascent in its development. So yeah, things are looking up and you know, this is two weeks later compared to the beginning of this video. So there's been some growth, but it's not terribly fast. Now keep in mind it is you know, January in the beginning of this video. So uh, there's lots and lots of rainy days uh, in San Diego County. It's just like that. It rains a lot. And when there's sun, I rush out and get some footage to show you my progress. But otherwise than that, these don't get a lot of sunlight because they're, you know, not directly exposed to the morning sun, only just afternoon sun. So there's an example of two leaves that are fused together I don't know what caused that um, mutation to occur or just random event, but there it is. And I wonder how that'll turn out. So some of the leaves are getting pretty big. Um, they look a little healthier now, still kind of yellowish somewhat. But yeah, I mean, some of them nearly fill up the entirety of my palm. So um, yeah, things are coming along pretty well. Uh, one side of the pot is largely unoccupied and let's see you got that clover underneath that's kind of trying to beat the canopy so to speak and come out and yeah the leaves look pretty healthy i checked for spider mites and other kinds of parasites that might feed on the leaves i don't see any leaf hoppers or anything like that and the showering watering can really helps to get the tops of everything clean and the stems, but I'm kind of worried about the undersides because that's where, um, you know, spider mites like to hang out and suck out the contents of the plant cells one by one until, you know, you lose everything. Unless you spray insecticide, but so far I've seen some spots and I'm not sure that there's really a problem or is that just, you know, dry uh, potting mix, dirt and dust that just kind of flies around in the air as I prepare a potting mix for my upcoming plant series. So this is the first one to start in 2017, but I have many things going on and I look forward to being able to provide a lot more content uh, this year compared to previous years. And also just make episodes that contain more content and progression as well. Because in the past I would just have, you know, a second episode where it just does it covers like five or ten days and that's just not enough I think to whet most people's appetites you know they want to see more uh, progress in terms of you know growth in one episode or one video so this is day 136 you can see the two leaves that are fused together have gotten much bigger and that leaf well the dual leaf is more uh, erect compared to all these other droopy leaves because it's got two of those mid veins and let's see that little thing there hasn't grown a, a bit I think it's gotten slightly more green you know this is definitely the picture of health there's a small hole in that leaf I think it, it was just there it spawned naturally and basically everything is getting bigger although I think some of these are starting to fall over, like this big center one. 
It's kind of funny. This is kind of the orientation. I have it on a lazy Susan so I can spin it around and show you stuff. But um, this middle one uh, has tilted away from the sun, which is kind of odd. I think maybe that's because the leaves have to angle themselves to get as much of that uh, angled afternoon sun as possible. And maybe it bumped into the plants, the two plants in front of it and just kind of grew away from that. But the other three are smaller, so they seem to be relatively erect compared to this middle one. And these are supposed to be vines, so at some point if they get too long, you know, this would just fall over the side and into the shade. So then I would have to spin the whole pot around. You can see some yellow spots on that one leaf that just passed by. Not sure if that's due to uh, me watering during the day previously and as some people will say you know the beads form um you know mini magnifying glasses before the evaporator dry out and then that just magnifies the afternoon direct sun and burns the leaves and spots and if you keep doing that supposedly it's really bad so i'm going to start watering um, either at night or when there's not direct sun shining on my plants and I think that will help a little bit and the showering definitely helps uh, clean off a dirt and you know cobwebs and things like that although this plant is remarkably free of pests I haven't seen anything really no spider mites um, no webs uh, the Joshua tree had all these singular threads of webbing that I had to get rid of that were starting to connect to this pot which I normally have on the other side instead of um, you know to the left of the Joshua pot but you know it's day 143 and everything looks really really healthy uh, growth is very robust so uh, the middle plant hasn't fallen over anymore compared to previously but I think it's gotten a little bit taller that fused leaf is bigger and yeah, there's just no problems. Everything's very green, uh, no damage. I think I'm doing everything right. And there's really no reason why I should try to change things up right now until I see, you know, a slowing in growth or problems later. But, you know, what's interesting is that uh, clover, uh, I don't know what species that is, it just keeps getting taller. It can actually compete with um, these four passion fruit vines it's uh you can see in the middle there it's got all these uh, clovers sticking out to the all the way to the top so it's i don't know if it's uh, a pest at this point but supposedly they have nitrogen fixing bacteria that can release um, usable nit nitrogen for all the other plants in this pot but you know if it gets too big it might be a nuisance because it's obviously competing for nutrients and water but I don't know I just think it's kind of interesting to leave it there so yeah there might be some kind of root competition going on in the soil otherwise you know how did those uh, two out of the six already just die off like that or never develop I'm thinking because I didn't steam this soil I baked it maybe there were a lot of air spaces and you know roots don't do well in just direct air after a while they just don't elongate and maybe that happened for those two seedlings and then they just croaked right there they just went into stasis can't get enough water no matter how much I saturate this soil with water so yeah everything's looking very beautiful and I hope to report um, a much much bigger progression as the weather gets warmer and sunnier and I'll see you next time for the next episode Hi, welcome back for a third episode of Growing Passion Fruit Vines from Seeds. It's day 149. I got some footage when I was taking a walk of a clover species that's kind of unique. It grows upright. They look like miniature trees uh, this close up. So I was thinking maybe that's the species that's not infesting my pot, but it's just growing there. You know, a lot of seeds blow up to my balcony and they land in there. You can kind of see it from here through the foliage. And it's curved because it got, you know, kind of bent or crushed by all these uh, passion fruit vines that are just way taller. So everything looks pretty healthy except for this little yellow uh, leafed one that's at the bottom. 
and I'm going to pull the clover right now and later that little yellow one right next to it, the passion fruit vine that's just not doing well and that's what it looks like so I think it fell over a few times that's why it's not upright but the root hasn't really established itself well so I guess when I pulled it all the secondary roots broke or maybe it didn't really have uh, that many forks going out so hardly any resistance to that and I'll pull this one out um, I'm spinning this around I moved it over to be on the lazy Susan to give you a better look at everything but this was kind of near the wall in position and just like the clover you know the root is very shallow I think because I baked this potting mix I didn't steam uh, the potting mix like I did with all my other pots where um, four pots of steam soil became three um, after I steamed them in volume so that removed all the airspace this was just baked soil as you can see from the beginning of the first episode of the series so maybe there's a lot of airspace in there and that little seedling this one just never had enough contact with the soil um, it had a problem with water uptake so it just never did well uh, other explanations are maybe there's some kind of biological warfare going on between the root systems but you know the others look pretty healthy so I'm tending not to think that was it it's day 157 and as one of you suggested last time I better pull all of the uh, other ones because this pot is only big enough really for one I know from my honeydew series in 2013 I had a lot I mean this one required a lot of pulling so um, this one is much more established than that little one I just pulled out in the previous update so that's what the root system looks like and once they get deeper and deeper you know it just requires an incredible amount of force to pull these out but you can see the leaves are sort of curled and I don't really know why that is yet I think maybe just not enough water or the the soil is over salted there's too much solutes in there nutrients after all the potting mix that I use um, it's supposed to be fertilized for a year so it's probably got a lot of things in there salts and uh, various nutrients so maybe these plants just have a problem um, uptaking enough water so I'm gonna pat that down and pull out another one so there's only three left after pulling out that one and geez this one really takes a lot of force to pull out so yeah basically made a big mess when that flew out and as you can see the root systems pretty developed in terms of you know secondary tertiary roots going out like that and the foliage looks healthy it's kind of a pity to have to pull these out but you can see that leaf at the top the new one it's three pronged so some of you were wondering you know how come the leaves don't look like uh, the passion fruit vine leaves in my area of uh, for example some southern states you know maybe that's why the leaves don't differentiate and become their final morphology until they've you know been growing for a few weeks in this case it's been a, a few months so I'm pulling out the last one so that's three of the major ones that were perfectly healthy up until this point and that's the root system so the second one was hardest to pull out uh, this one is kind of like the first you know it's got healthy foliage but it's kind of droopy it's not getting enough water for sure the trigger pressure is kind of low but otherwise than that I mean it's seemingly healthy it's getting all the nutrition it needed and I'm gonna cut those up do a little clean up pat down work and first things first I'm going to fertilize I'm going to take a crushed multivitamin to provide macronutrients and micronutrients. So I eat one of these every day. They really help with my eyesight. If I don't take multivitamins, then you know my eyes get tired. I have contacts in all the time, and you know it's just at the end of the day, without vitamin supplementation, um, you know my eyes just get tired and I can't see as well. But if I have enough vitamins then everything's fine but anyway that's for me these are for my plants you know just one vitamin pill it's got a lot of calcium carbonate in it but I'm gonna spread the crushed powder I'm using a vice grip 
It's pretty fun to use. These things were cheap at Lowe's. Uh, it's just that my old pair of pliers, the one with the rubber orange handles, that was all rusted and it didn't serve that much functionality. This one has adjustability. It's a fun tool. Um, right now I don't need it for anything else, but I decided since I don't have another standard pair of pliers, I might as well just use that to crush up my vitamin pill. So the vitamin pill is mostly calcium carbonate and it's got a lot of things, some I guess soluble, some insoluble that need fats to dissolve um, in your stomach. But anyway, uh, I'll spread that out on the top so when I water from the top, all the nutrients will percolate through the soil. I'm taking these uh, plants that I just ripped up. Um, granted, they took all of their micronutrients, uh, secondary um, macronutrients and primary, I guess, from the soil. Only thing they got from the air was carbon dioxide. That's how plants add a lot of mass. You know, they just keep absorbing carbon dioxide from the air through their stomata and undergo photosynthesis to make sugars. And then after that, basically, they have the energy to use to make all the other compounds from the elements, trace elements and minerals they absorb from the soil and their surroundings. So I'm just going to use this as a compost. Uh, it's going to be kind of dry so I know it's not really like how most people make compost but I'll just keep it at the top like leaf litter see if anything interesting happens and water from the top. But first I'm going to add some miracle Grow Singles. I add half a packet you know, this provides the three primary macronutrients. Um, before, I kind of thought there were just the three, um, you know, nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, uh, was it potassium compounds that have to be in usable form. But there's also other ones, you know, the calcium and the vitamin pill. That's also actually a macronutrient. And there are two other elements as well that I'll list. Um, but I'll just sprinkle this on the top. And I guess this is actually better than using liquid fertilizer this way because uh, if you use liquid fertilizer, it's really concentrated when you first get it on top. So there's a tendency to splash even micro droplets that you can't really see unless you're looking really, really close. That would splash on the undersides or the sides or the tops of your leaves and then that would burn your leaves. So I'm just going to water with uh, my watering can from the top, wash off the foliage thoroughly. Granted, there is a leaf that's kind of touching, you know, uh, a freshly made, you know, detritus on the top. But um, that one actually has a burn leaf end, or maybe that's later in this video. But yeah, I'm just going to water everything off, wash the undersides of the leaves, get rid of the dust or any potential mites or parasites. It might be there, although I don't think there are any right now. It's a pretty robust plant. I don't think there are any infestations so far. So it's day 163, and I'm wondering why, in the absence of anything pressing against this plant, it insists on growing away from the sun instead of towards it. It shows no signs of corrective action. I mean, it has some new foliage, but um, that's a two-prong leaf that's been there for a long time. And finally, we have some three-prong leaves. Um, tendrils to grab onto things. There's nothing to grab on here. And the leaf ends are kind of, there's a loss of turgor pressure at the very tip of this primary vine shoot. So I'm thinking this thing has a problem with there's either airspace in the soil so the roots aren't absorbing enough water because I've been watering a lot or uh, the roots just need to go deeper. You can see back of a cotyledon actually down there in the middle. So that's what the back looks like. Uh, my leaves are very healthy. Um, they're like molten wax on a hot day. They're no longer super droopy, but I noticed that roots were growing into the watering tray. You can barely see two of them there. And I didn't get good footage with a flashlight later, but basically I looked there a few days later and after this copious watering, which I'm showing you right now, the water tray filled up and those roots started branching out and having secondary roots and forks in the watering tray. I didn't get footage of that. I kind of regret that, but you know, I watered a lot and right afterwards the water kept overflowing, so that's a huge hassle. It takes a lot of time for water to percolate through to get to the bottom. So on day 170, I got a cheap bin to collect overflow. I know what that looks like and it looks pretty gross, but actually there's no smell 
uh, fungus gnat drowned in there. I didn't see any mosquito larva or anything. I don't think they can make it in such a concentrated thing. So I've got a foot-long tendril. This thing is banging up against a flat wall, which has nothing to climb on. You can see the three-pronged leaf getting bigger. Maybe these are shade plants, kind of like the California wild grape, uh, under the canopy when they're young. So in, say, a riparian zone or a forest, you know, it just needs to uh, have very big dark green leaves to photosynthesize and capture as much uh, indirect sun or you know um, sun that does get through the canopy of the forest uh, when they're young before they can climb all the way up so maybe these early leaves are just not suited for uh, full-on photosynthesis in the full sun maybe they'll get fried but I'm gonna turn this in the bin and I had to do that very gingerly because the Joshua tree was threatening to tear this up as I spun it but I'm gonna do this and see how the vine responds because it's just not behaving rationally it keeps going towards the door and it was like that way for all four of the healthy seedlings before and you have plenty video evidence of that um, they were all just growing away from the Sun so it's day 177 I over flooded the pot again and some of it ran off but it there's been a market improvement shown, an explosion of new leaves. So you can see here, you know, I, I thought it would have trouble orienting all those old established leaves and medium sized ones, but that's not the case. This thing's longer than my hand. It's kind of unsightly because of the wrinkles. It's kind of waffled on the edges. I think there's no recovery from that. So this is the oldest two prong leaf, um, the one that I thought was a mutant. It's big and healthy. But I don't understand why it's making more, I guess. There's going to be that intermediate phase where it transitions from things very low on the base of the trunk or the base of the primary stem to where, you know, you have some of those two-prongers. And then you have three-prongers like that. The leaf edge is burned. So that's a troubling development. Maybe it can't handle full sun. Um, this thing got impaled on the Joshua tree before I tied down... The, th the primary vine with a piece of green string as you just saw so it has two holes on it, it actually broke the tips of those uh, Joshua tree leaves but I just kind of righted them without breaking them off so you can see there's still a hydration problem I'm thinking the roots and the water tray just have to fork out in all directions and just become more extensive and we'll stop seeing that I do kind of get the impression that some of these new medium-sized leaves look very healthy a healthier than the old ones in that they're not waffled or kind of wavy on the edges so maybe that's a consequence of me just watering so much that I have flushed out a lot of the solutes that are creating salty conditions in the soil and you know the yellow liquid in the overflow bin that's got a lot of nutrients in it so I'm not gonna pour it out or wash it away or anything it could come in handy later when this vine gets really really big and then I can just uh, overflow that bin so it'll never be thirsty but I'm wondering if these little fragments are actually trying to regenerate because I think these leaves have gotten bigger that could just be based off nutrition in the existing stem but I'm starting to think that's not the case welcome back it's day 184 of my growing passion fruit from seed series the overflow tray concept is working out very nicely you can see all the overflow there. At some point I ran out of the ability to provide distilled water for this plant. It just needs way too much water for that. So I started using tap water in my showering can, just liters and liters at a time. And in the previous episode I discussed uh, you know, some leaves being curled. Maybe that's due to an overabundance of nutrients. This one is a good example. It's kind of ruffled on the edges, although it looks otherwise very healthy. It's very verdant and green. So uh, it's got all these, uh, you know, offshoots growing in the wrong direction. Still not sure whether this is intended to grow underneath the canopy of something else. I would think so, as with most vines. And it would take a while for them to reach all the way to the top of the canopy so there's like some beige scars there sort of whitish on the base of the main stem I don't know where those came from it's not like I scratched it or uh, brushed against it with a rough object and you got some of those intermediate leaves with two prongs 
and a lot of uh, just kind of starter looking leaves with just one prong. So there's a big one with two prongs and the ones that go over the balcony you know that I tied down with this green string now some of them look burned and you know back when I did the honeydew growing series in 2013 you know I had a lot of problems uh, with my leaves I think just all the heat um, reflecting off the concrete you know just roasted a lot of leaves so I'm not sure what the problem is but um, that's my theory and I've been watering from the top continuously like this. Um, I think at this point in the filming, I was still using distilled water. And then later on, in the end of April 2017, when this was filmed, I just uh, started using lots of tap water. So uh, tap water is okay if you can get, you know, tons of flow through because you could just wash out all the excess minerals. It's day 198 and there's been some more growth uh, the leaves haven't really gotten bigger but there's more of them there's more vine growth the vines are longer and I pretty much um, shoved all the offshoots through the railings or tied them to the top of the the main rail so they're just growing up freely and you can see thin yellowish spots on some of the ones that are more exposed to the afternoon sun although that one's not even over the rail and these older leaves that are just big and sort of ruffled or uh, curled like that I mean they're doing their job I mean they're really big uh, I'm really surprised that no leaves have turned yellow yet and fallen off so there's evidence that suggests that these tiny cuttings are alive and growing I originally noticed them you know, I cut up everything in was it episode two or three and just threw it down there from the other three vines that I tried to grow in the beginning of this series. And, you know, I planted some of those uh, perpendicular into the soil. I think they survived this entire time just by uh, drinking water while um, lying parallel to the ground, you know, because they were immersed in ponding mixed particles and getting watered every two days uh, they were just passively absorbing water so I took them out they had no roots and then uh, you know I, I sort of planted them as deep as I could which is not much because there were tiny cuttings everything else all those like clippings and uh, whatnot that I cut up pretty much uh, died and formed this artificial uh, leaf litter that provides uh, nutrient recycling back to the soil so that leaf looks to be in rough shape. You can see all these other uh, new leaf primordia popping up. Lots of really long tendrils, as I showed in the previous episode. They can get up to a foot long. I actually don't really like them in this context, uh, you know, because they never end up curling around the rails. Uh, the rails are too thick, so they just end up uh, latching on to other areas of stem and strangulating them. Uh, they constrict the growth. So I always have to cut them. So it's day 213. So there's continued growth, uh, but I'm always asking the question, are the vines healthy? In this case, it's just one vine. Foliage looks okay overall. You know, nothing really wrong with uh, the shade of the green and the overall coloration. Uh, some of these leaves look to be roasted and disfigured. But uh, there's nothing I can really do about that. You know, if I had everything going inwards, there would just be no room. Uh, my sweet Annie is really big. It's an annual, but I decided, you know, I can't just sacrifice that and have uh, this vine choke around it um, inside the balcony. I don't think long term any of those solutions are viable. People are always like, you know, you should get a trellis or a, a wire mesh or something. But using the balcony rail is the, really the only practical solution. And it gets it way more afternoon sun starting from past noon. Um, you know, depending on the angle of the sun and the season, uh, it might take until 2 or 3 p.m. sometimes to get full afternoon sun hitting this uh, inside of the balcony. So we're looking at these again, and they're getting bigger. So I don't know if they have roots yet. I don't want to disturb anything, but I've been watering every two days. And, you know, it's pretty impressive that these tiny little cuttings have survived that long. In fact, it takes a lot of those leaves that I cut up 
and uh, leaf fragments to just turn yellow and finally dehydrate and die. They last for a really long time. So I drain that tray and it's going a little dry again. Because I have the watering tray hole facing the other way, I had to do that reorientation to get the vine to go over the balcony rail. I don't really have a good idea of how full the watering tray of the pot itself is at all times. It's facing the other side. Um, but if I overwater, I'll notice uh, stuff in the collection tray. So that's basically how I know you can't go too long uh, without watering from the top. This is a very thirsty plant, like most vines, so um, one thought is I'm washing these leaves uh, that are close to the base of the stem, and those seem to be the healthiest at all times, and there's, you know, maybe one or two at the bottom that kind of annoy me because they always uh, get wet and touch the bottom of the wet soil, but they haven't been burned or anything by fertilizer. They haven't uh, rotted yet. So it just goes to show my theory of, you know, like wet leaves touching the soil that doesn't always uh, portend doom. You know, if your plant's healthy, it can uh, survive a lot of that stuff. And this has a lot of big leaves that can just go over the edge, so it's not even a problem. So it's day 234. It's been a really long time. Um, I siphoned out the overflow catch tray twice. A uh, bee drowned in here. You know, it gets kind of disgusting after a while, especially just due to the coloration, but I think, as I mentioned in episode 3, it's so concentrated with fertilizer in there that bugs and mosquitoes can't get a foothold. And it drowns out a lot of uh, the fungus gnat larvae. You know, so the new seedling over there, I think, just came from a seed that germinated very late. And it's yellow. It's just like the ones before. There are some yellow leaves there. So, you know, at the end of this uh, video, I have a footnote that just says I fertilized after this episode ended with a packet of miracle Grow and a crushed multivitamin. So these uh, vine offshoots are just going everywhere. See, that doesn't look healthy at all. And then, you know, those just look roasted. Maybe they're just too close to the concrete. So it's an unnatural environment, I know. I let that tendril over there just kind of curl onto a leaf petiole, not doing much damage. If they uh, bind to each other, that's fine too. As you can see, there are two leaf tendrils just curled. So some of these are really, really curly. And uh, you can see a little bug over there. I don't know what that is. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not really good with my uh, ornithoptera or whatever. You know, I, I don't know what that is. It's some other kind of bug, flying bug, that just landed there. I don't know how many of these are sap suckers, so to speak. Uh, you know, leaf hopper, scale insects, or whatever. But uh, this leaf doesn't look to be in too bad of a shape compared to how bad the honeydew leaves used to get. I, I think there's a little bit of uh, gray mildew on there. Very careful to switch gloves after I film this uh, section of the episode and you know, switch to filming my other plants. I don't want to pass that around, but it's pretty much a hallmark of vines. If you look at my um, other two melon vine series from 2013, 2014, that's basically how it goes. Like, uh, once you reach a certain critical mass of growth and you just have really long vines and too many leaves, doesn't matter if, it, if it's indoors or outdoors, you're going to get some kind of mold and raw and dead spots uh, it's just uh, going to be completely different of an experience compared to many other plants uh, you know like joshua tree it's not very big but the leaves are meant to continuously die off in that as you can see from all my wild footage from joshua tree national park but i don't really have a frame of reference to uh, wild vines outdoors for uh you know, things like this, melon vines and uh, passion fruit vines and whatnot. I could definitely say, though, that uh, California wild grapevines uh, have huge, uh, for the most part, very healthy looking leaves in the outside. It looks like they're covered in spider mite webbings, though, but 
they never get to the point where you know they've just got mold growing on them outright and uh, yeah so basically there are some yellow leaves there the stem keeps getting thicker and thicker it's like pinky thick now but um you know aside from fertilizing and just waiting and doing more watering I don't really know what I can do alright it's day 266 I can't believe it's been the better part of a year since I started sowing these seeds and watering it's been a really long time and as you can see I have a vine offshoot I'm not sure if this is the main one I kinda lose track after too many offshoots uh, branch out in different directions but this one's uh, notable it has very healthy leaves I think the fertilization has definitely helped so the problem was a problem of under fertilization early on that one kinda has a maybe a tear mutation actually this one does too they kind of have these uh, hooks or extra prongs um, between the three main prongs so you can see the leaves that were outside of the balcony and from an earlier epic are just uh, curled and not doing too well the newer ones all look really healthy like this and I think that's purely the product of adequate hydration and lots of fertilizer lately so this thing uh, loves my Joshua tree because it's stiff it provides a lot of structure it keeps trying to body splash it and I have to keep trying to rip off these uh, tendrils that get very hard after they coil around something and some of these are meant to be growing you know in an in inwards direction so it's kind of hard to loop them out there especially if they're not long enough from the point of origin then they just kind of make this uh, high tension bend like that and I have to keep doing this or just wait for them to get much longer otherwise they'll just uh, come back in at some point you know when I'm not looking or a few gusts of wind come by so that's all I can do it keeps trying to make in inroads into the balcony with uh, further offshoots that's just the nature of a lot of vines especially this one in the earlier episodes I discussed how maybe it's intended to be a partial sun or a shade plant because it's supposed to climb up something to get to the top of the canopy and I think you know I'm still kind of debating whether that's true or not it seems like all the foliage that's uh, growing inwards is very healthy and it keeps trying to come inwards whereas the stuff that goes out you know it's now outnumbered by the stuff trying to come in and I don't know if the plant's trying to tell me something but you know, some people say it's just uh, due to a lack of structure for climbing, but you know, it just keeps growing inwards even when there's nothing to climb, as you can see from the beginning of this video. And from my century plant update on the same day, um, basically I showed a little bit of footage of a hummingbird coming by. I bet it's really excited at the prospect of this thing flowering, or at least my sweet Annie. It's just seen a lot of vegetative growth, and it's claim my balcony as its own territory so here's another example of something where there's nothing to climb and it's just racing away from the Sun but I don't have a balcony that's large enough to support a shade loving plant in its entirety like this this is way too big of an organism to contain within just a few square feet just as you can see with my sweet Annie it's taking up the whole balcony so that was the seedling on top those are the two cuttings that respawn from tiny little nodes they were laying horizontally until I watered a lot from the top and the water level is getting low relative to where it was in the plastic reservoir which is very important because the watering tray itself kept overflowing and I need to have a larger store of water for these plants if I were to ever step away for more than a day or two so I'm just gonna flood water from the top and dissolve those miracle grow fertilizer crystals. I know it hasn't been a very long time since I last fertilized but it's proven very effective thus far and the foliage I wouldn't say it has recovered since the leaves that were already wrinkled and curled uh, are gonna stay that way but the new foliage has looked great a lot better than it did before so I'm just gonna keep doing what I've been doing and hopefully it'll respond very positively over the next few months just like my honeydew 
melon vine eventually got to flowers and melons. I don't know if this will do all of that in one season though because it's a perennial. If I were to move and go to a larger balcony, for example, I'd have to prune away most of the growth and lose all, most of my gains for 2017 and just start over from you know, the thick stem, main stem, and maybe some very thick offshoots. So if you haven't done so already, please uh, look me up on my Facebook page for this YouTube channel and my Instagram account. It's got interesting content that you won't see here. Thanks. Welcome back. It's day 272 of my Growing Passion Fruit from Seed series. This fine offshoot on the other side of the balcony, several feet away, is getting longer and longer. You just saw a little black ant crawling around aimlessly on the foliage. That's what they do to my plants. They don't seem to be eating anything, haven't detected any infestations. Uh, these few leaves in the center of this offshoot are interesting. They have extra prongs, seemingly. Uh, no real reason for those to appear, but you know the leaf development is very interesting. The leaf morphology of this plant is, um, you know, they start off with singular prongs, uh, normal looking leaves like many other plants. Like you can see two right here that are like that, and then the rest start to differentiate into the three pronged uh, leaf shape that we're so familiar with now. And as you can see, some of these older leaves are just dry and wrinkled, curled, very gnarly looking. But the new leaves um, outside of the balcony rail and inside all look very healthy. I think all the fertilization has really, really helped. And yeah, the new leaves are doing great. I have to keep trimming these tendrils because sometimes they curl around. Um, new offshoot primordia, you know, other vines, um, other locations, I mean. I mean, it's all pretty much the same vine, right? And then any plant that's nearby, such as the Joshua tree or this California goldenrod, sometimes get choked out a little bit by tendrils. Tendrils can be very destructive. They can constrict growth of other places in the vine or just wreck the foliage. You know, if they start doing their curling routine, as you can see there, forms a very tight coil after a while. And before that, they could be a foot long and just uh, wait for some contact to be made with something else to curl around. So those fine offshoots against the wall, they used to climb higher on the stucco. Now they're too heavy and they've fallen down and they're uh, trying to curl around each other. So I watered a little too hard there in the center. These... Uh, that's a seedling. These two are cuttings. They're doing better, but they grow very slowly. I have to water every day or two. And I took off the rubber showering can, shower cap, and basically poured some water on there to get it in faster. And then that exposed a bunch of little roots. I think those are from the main plant. This is another vine offshoot that's just restricting my space and maneuverability in the balcony. So I'm going to water again with the rubber cap plugged into my showering can and ensure it's a very gentle stream. What I could do later on to cover up those uh, roots in the middle is just sprinkle on some sterilized potting mix. But I'm not sure if the plant would just respond by spawning yet more fine roots to colonize all of the soil. I think that's what it does. That's why every time I water like this it tends to flood at the top and I see all this bubbling for a few minutes it's because the soil mass is completely dry despite maybe the bottom third or fourth of the soil mass being completely soaked in uh, artificial you know water table essentially for this plant it doesn't have much soil volume to go by so it just sucks out all the water and it has roots in the watering tray drinking everything as well so as you can see this is just a tangled mess outside and it keeps getting thicker and thicker from outside view. So thanks for watching this update. Uh, please remember to check out my Facebook page on this YouTube channel and my Instagram account as well. Alright it's day 281 of this series. You can see these foam cord like tendrils tangling with each other. So my intention was to make more regular updates that are two to three minutes long. Obviously this is twice that at 
six plus minutes long. That's because there's just so much to cover on this plan. It's so long. Um, to pan my camera over everything, it requires a lot of time. That's the only reason. So you can see this thing is invading everywhere. I have a series that I tried to get going in that pot that it just covered that you see nothing in. And I'll talk more about that later. Maybe I'll just make a post on, you know, a failed series on something I tried to grow. So for the meantime, I'll have to do a lot of tendril cutting and rerouting of these vine offshoots that keep trying to come towards the shade. So it's pretty much conclusive, like I said in the last few episodes, that it prefers to grow in the shade, not in direct sun. Although now with enough fertilization and water, it's doing well in full sun as well. The railing is getting covered. It keeps trying to do this to my Joshua tree. So I have to keep cutting all these tendrils. And in the process, if I'm not paying attention, I get poked by the Joshua tree. So it's just a lot of maintenance and trimming that I don't have to do with my other plants. And sometimes it helps to preventatively do some maintenance and just anticipate what's going to happen and cut all the tendrils that are elongating. They can get up to a foot long, as you've seen many times. So I have to keep rerouting things over the rail, throwing things over the rail, and hopefully, because it's bent towards the shade, it won't just uh, come back in with the next gust of wind. That won't happen if I reroute it over rails or if there's enough friction with other parts of the plant. And for this, it's just a good example of a tendril choking one of its own leaves. So I'm going to throw everything there like I did in the past and put it um, to use as compost on the top. It's amazing how all that um, top composting just worked out. Uh, all that stuff just disappeared from months past. So it's definitively conclusive from the last few months, maybe even the last two years, that people are most interested in fruit tree and fruit vine growing series. Uh, starting in 2015 with the California wild grapevine that got an enormous amount of views and interest followed by the avocado and navel orange tree series which were failures uh, before too long you know especially the navel orange but those got a lot of interest and you know knowing what i do now i'd probably do a much better job at growing those things but i think people want to see that and they want to see regular updates the passion fruit vine series is a clear winner of 2017 my three herbal series you know i thought that would garner a lot of interest because people love the ginger series back then in uh, 2013 that spanned all the way to 2014 I believe so I thought you know maybe people would be more interested but it seems like there's a balance between topics uh, plants uh, growing series that people will search on for uh, YouTube and on the Google search engine as well compared to rare things like Yerba Mansa before you right now. So Sweet Annie, California Goldenrod right here. You know, not many people know about those, so I think not much new viewership will be brought in. Only my most loyal viewers, handful of people will click on all those updates. So definitely I'll try to find a balance between uh, what people want to watch and, you know, uh, not so much just on what I'm interested in growing, you know. So I'm sure there's going to be a lot of things I can find that will be very interesting to grow. Uh, maybe even rare fruit tree cuttings, although, you know, there's always that balance. If it's too rare and nobody's heard of it, then nobody will be interested. Oh, well, it'll seem that way because nobody will find the video and uh, enter the search terms in search engines. So the water here is getting below the uh, watering tray level. That means the watering tray is probably dry again. And I'm watering another few liters from the top with this gentle spray can. I think all those dots on top of the white specks are vermiculite. They're lighter in density than everything else, so they just float to the top because I've flood watered this so many times. Uh, three little ones going on there, the seedling and the two cuttings. They're doing better. I'm just keeping those around as a curiosity. 
Now I don't have any intention of letting those grow to the scale of the main one and you can see here this is uh, choked on to the sweet ante. It's doing that uh, choking routine with its tendrils so eventually when this gets long enough I'll cut those and uh, fling it over the rail or weave it through one of the rail holes. So thanks for watching and please remember to check out my YouTube Facebook page. It doesn't have much viewership but I'm hoping to get a big following on that and if people like my posts then their friends will see because they're public posts and that will hopefully garner a lot more interest to my channel. So it's gotten to the point where for this plant sometimes I'm just pouring water into the tray or for the sweet ante I'm just pouring it on top of all that dead compost and that prevents all the splashing because these two plants need so much water every day practically that you know just showering like this takes forever. I'm just doing this for illustration purposes and you know so I don't disturb the soil more than I already have as you can see all the fine roots on top. So thanks for watching and stay tuned for further updates. Welcome back. It's day 283 of this Growing Passion Fruit from Seed Series. I'm Melvin Way. I know it's only been two days since the last update, but I wanted to show you what's going on with my passion fruit and the work I'm doing to this pot. So that's a seedling that's been around for a long time. It sprouted very late in the series. I've kept it, but it's not doing too well. The cuttings are actually doing better. I don't believe that's solely due to positioning. So the water has fallen beneath the top of the water tray and I used a siphon for the second time in this series to switch out the water essentially. Although there's not a lot you can do about all those scummy flakes and it would just be too much work and maneuvering to lift up this pot somehow and take out the tray so siphoning is the best way. So I just uh, scattered on some dry potting mix that I sterilized maybe two or three weeks ago or maybe it's been longer but it's bone dry and I just wanted to cover up those uh, fine roots that were exposed from previous waterings where I took off this rubber shower cap. So I'm watering from the top because I want the fertilizer, the vegetative growth kind from miracle Grow that I sprinkled on the top and covered up with some dirt to diffuse from top to bottom and not just be stuck there if I filled up the white tub with water, even if it was completely full, you know, the water table essentially would never generate a fast enough absorption gradient to get the top layer of soil wet and distribute the fertilizer. It would probably cause burns and those little seedlings and cuttings, the three on top, would never get any water. Those would dry out and be dead within a week's time, I bet because the main vine is so efficient at sucking water out of the dirt. The moment the water line in the white tub falls beneath the top of the watering tray opening, then all the dirt just gets desiccated almost immediately. So the demand for water is very, very considerable. The appearance of the balcony from the outside is getting better and better. It has a very lush feel now. I'm sure the neighbors and people walking by have noticed. So this is a problem with potting mix in general. If you have any low-lying, sprawling leaves, as I have with uh, many plant series in 2017, then they just get caked with potting mix particles. When you water from the top, you just kind of flood water and vermiculate, and all those light particles rise, and then they get trapped on the leaves. So you have to manually remove those later, or just shower them off, spray them off with water, it's kind of a chore, but it's just something you have to do. And since I increase the soil volume here today, it's just going to be more of a problem. But I'd like to keep these things alive on the top just for the sake of interest. Even though I know I'm just going with this main vine in the center. So if you remember from two days ago, there was that vine offshoot that attached to my sweet annie, sweet wormwood. I've rerouted that. It's finally long enough. And as I pulled off the tendrils, they were just coiled to the end of a branch of Sweet Annie. All this pollen, yellow pollen, just flew off and scattered around and swirled in the air because it's got all those little yellow flowers. 
So yeah, um, I'm not going to show all the watering. It took uh, maybe, I forgot how many liters I put in, maybe four containers of this. You know, that's uh, 12 liters, I believe. So in the end, I just took off the rubber showering cap and I poured water directly in the bottom after I was sure that the soil at the top got saturated with water. All right, so thanks for watching this update. It'll be probably another week before the next one. All right, it's day 288. I've been watering nonstop lately and filling the watering tray directly. The big plastic white one I have below. Well, it's not actually that big. In retrospect, I should have gotten something bigger, but to maintain a smaller footprint, I got this thing, which fits perfectly the base of the pot. So I've siphoned the waste overflow twice and now the water doesn't look gross anymore. I think the brown disgusting appearance, you know, sort of brownish yellow before, which uh, obviously reminds you of something else. Um, that was just due to the potting mix itself and whatever was dissolvable and all those sphagnum peat moss chunks and uh, uh, wood chips and whatnot, little branch fragments um, that would just come out over time sort of like you're washing out a dye so I don't know at what stage this thing will flower in many cases I heard it doesn't flower in the first year and this is the first year so I'm spraying some uh, sprinkling some miracle grow fertilizer and I think this whole fertilizer burn thing is overblown as long as you rinse everything off thoroughly with a showering can you're good to go you know, fertilizer burn doesn't occur unless you have a concentrated uh, spot or have potting mix that has a lot of fertilizer in it and you just uh, have leaves resting directly on it for a while. Okay, so I'm just going to dissolve that and wash away that area on the branch you know, that I um, touched with some of those blue uh, chemical fertilizer crystals and then I'll be good to go. The flowering miracle Grow contains a different macronutrient composition than the regular one although I think it's also fine to just keep using the vegetative growth one although I did have this experience in 2013 with my honeydew vine where um, you know I stopped using all the vegetative growth one and then I flushed out the pot soil a few times with tap water and then a flowers appeared buds appeared the next day so I've been filling this tray directly like this almost every day it's amazing how much water this thing uses the top layer of soil which is not much above the water table that dries out every day so it's day 289 I would estimate the water usage somewhere between three and five liters a day a five is a high estimate if it's been thirsty and deprived and you know three Plus, you know, that's the lower estimate if I've been watering every day. So 3.78 liters, that's a gallon of water. That's a very, very high demand. It's rivaling uh, the honeydew vine pot, which had three vines back in the day, um, twisting over this balcony and using it as a trellis. So you're comparing three vines to just one today. And... You know, I gotta do this all the time. Well, I don't have to, but it's just for aesthetic reasons. I don't like seeing its own leaves get choked and gnarled like that. See, that's just gonna be deformed from now on. There's nothing I can do. If something just, you know, uh, bunches up against a wall or rail, then it's gonna be somewhat deformed. But despite some deformations, even some leaves in the middle here that were uh, in the not enough fertilizer period earlier in the series, especially in the beginning. You know, that's why this thing took a hundred days to germinate, in my opinion. So I moved some pots down. I stained this uh, wooden table. You know, it's just an unstained table I got off Amazon last year, and it's been great, except the wood stain that I use, it somewhat rubs off that uh, reddish color, you know, just with water, so it's uh, somewhat water-soluble. It's not completely uh, just organic solvent soluble. So you can see all these tendrils. Uh, yeah, I pluck like maybe 10 whenever I feel like it, which is every day or two, uh, uh, maybe two days or three days, you know. And then 
I uh, break them up, rip them up. Sometimes I use scissors, sometimes I just use my fingernails and I throw them as compost on top and they, everything seems to disappear, everything that's been used as compost. So as you can see there's a lot of new foliage just in the day or two that I'm staining that table, um, the observation table, you know the vine immediately just encroaches from many different offshoots and new offshoots come it's got to bug this California goldenrod which you know went through a rough patch it just has to get into everything and try to coil and bug every single plant I have so just in the meantime I've moved some some of the other plants uh, low priority ones that don't have much interest uh, down to the base they still get some sun although because this thing has so many leaves that's starting to block that out you can see some water spots um, San Marcos slash San Diego, Southern California, tap water is very hard. So these things are doing well, these uh, four seedlings, two of them are seedlings, two are cuttings. As you can see the water level is already down to the top of the watering tray of the pot. So I gotta water again, thanks for watching. Alright, it's day 297 of this growing passion fruit vine from Seed Series. I'm Melvin Way. All these vine offshoots are getting thicker and greener meaning more leaf mass is accumulating on this end of the balcony some of those leaves look droopy I know that's because there's not enough water in the watering tray again this thing can't go two days literally without being dehydrated it's noteworthy that there are several very large and beautiful leaves that have no defects but at the same time there are some leaves from the past during a period of malnutrition which look a little bit misshapen they're stiff and wrinkled. So I'm going to fertilize more heavily this time. Use some tums. Each tab contains 0.75 grams, 750 milligrams calcium carbonate. That's what bones are made of. I'm going to do two vitamins at least. Those are vitamins that I eat and since last year I've been using. See that's a sign of nutrient deficiency so hopefully this infusion of calcium will really help this out this offshoot will be pruned now, there's too many offshoots like this coming in and intruding on my space so as you can see the foliage mostly looks lush and perfect but if you look closer there are some malformed leaves from days past probably get rid of that offshoot as well and prune away all these leaves that are scattered around the base of the stem that are quite unnecessary. Some are very large and old so I'll be sad to see those go. But As you can see the fourth seedling there died. So that's a seedling on top and these two are cuttings that grew on their own and I righted them and planted them perpendicularly in the soil. So the water level has gone down to the top of the watering tray that means the plant is not accessing that water. It occurred to me to make a cut or a drill hole on the bottom of the watering tray so it could just drink all the way to the bottom of this white tray and have access to all that water. It would probably send roots out. So that's all the fertilizer, the miracle growth for vegetative growth, the crush men's health multivitamins, the tums that contain extra calcium carbonate. I know calcium could potentially raise the pH and cause a little bit of buffering. Not sure if this is an acid soil loving plant or whatnot but you can see it's a lot easier to fertilize and not have to deal with the uh, leaves at the base of the main trunk so there's going to be a lot more sunlight hitting this mass since I water so much it'll decay fast and I try to flip all the leaves from the three surviving seedlings and cuttings over this uh, veritable passion fruit leaf salad so you can see chunks of vitamins that haven't dissolved. Those actually dissolve very easily if you just wait for a few minutes and come back later. Maybe I don't even need to crush them. Thanks for watching and please come back soon. Alright, it's day 305 of this Growing Passion Fruit from Seed Series. I'm very excited because I learned something new and interesting about this plant by observing it up close. And I also saw flower primordia, which you may have guessed from the photo thumbnail of this episode update. But first things first I'm going to do a lot of watering. Uh, water 
level in the overflow tray fell down to the level of the natural opening for the water collection tray for this pot. So that means almost all the water has been exhausted inside the watering tray. It can't access the rest. So I water from the top, flood watered essentially for almost six liters, five and a half liters. Water usage varies a lot for this plant. It could be anything from one liter on a cloudy day where it's cooler, you know, in the 70s and Fahrenheit, the low 20s and Celsius, all the way to five liters on a hot sunny day. I think it's about 30 Celsius today, mid to high 80s. So I pruned everything away, which makes the watering and fertilization easy. I don't have to deal with all that foliage uh, directly around the main stems and vines. So this vine has grown considerably from the parking lot. I can see it's grown um, considerably downwards. I might have to uh, pull up some of those new offshoots and just trim them. Although I know this passion fruit vine won't quit. Some of the healthiest foliage is in the middle. And you can see all these leaves, they look the best for the most part. A plant prefers shade or a partial sun environment stuff over the balcony you know it's growing and it's probably doing a lot of photosynthesis but it's never quite as healthy and all the offshoots continue to try to climb back over the balcony rail and come back in at all times so that's the plant's preference if you're ever growing this in a different setup it's something to pay attention to and as you can see it takes a long time for the water even 30 minutes later after I shot this footage to reach these far ends of these new offshoots because the amount of piping essentially that the water has to get through to reach this place and for the plant to build a water pressure trigger pressure and everything you know this is the last place that's going to get it but flower primordia have started to appear and grow uh, literally the day after my last episode so you can see these bumps that I'm pointing to. Um, there's a set of them between the petiole and the leaf and you can see all these little black ants patrolling. They're the same ants that have been burying my tums and other pots and just uh, doing interesting things. Uh, they were in the watering tray of the sweet annie plant towards the end of that second to last episode. So those are basically extra floral nectaries. That's something new I learned. They're not galls or anything created by gall wasps or um, you know, areas bitten and parasitized by these ants. They basically secrete nectar long before there are flowers and then the ants drink nectar as they patrol up and down these vines. They go the full length of the entire vine and all its offshoots and basically if there were anything parasitizing the plant such as uh, spider mites they would probably kill them and just eat them so that's a good food source for these ants and the passion fruit vine is very robust you can see these different states of development actually I don't know what that thing is at the bottom looks like a bunch of tentacles not quite like tendrils it could be another flower so that's how they look in the beginning and you know a few days later the bulbs start to develop the flower primordia bulbs actually look like they have a little bit of uh, bumps on them too. You know, extra floral nectaries. You can see an ant here feeding from one, getting its sugar reward from the plant. So it's a minor investment to pay these little mercenaries to keep them interested in crawling all over the plant as a food source. Not sure that there would be enough for these workers to bring back to the colony and feed other ants. Maybe they can. So I've also seen ants show some interest in the flower primordia. Maybe they're already secreting nectar in those little bumps I saw and mentioned. And this vine offshoot goes all the way down to the ground. The others keep trying to climb the wall, so they want to go up. But you also have all these leaves in a dark area. I'm not sure if these are really even functional because hardly any sun reaches there, maybe only for you know, 10, 20, 30 minutes a day, if even. I mean, they're under the canopy of all this other stuff on top. 
So some of that foliage seems to be droopy no matter how much I water and I could just prune those away because it's evident that the water supply can't reach there. So you can see an ant showing interest in some of those bumps on the flower primordia. I'm really looking forward to the upcoming flower show. Please stay tuned to my YouTube channel and thanks for watching. It's day 307. I have a mosquito larvae infestation. Click on the associated video link to see the experiment related to getting rid of these things. I had to act right then and there, otherwise they probably would have emerged as adults within a few hours. Hi, my name is Melvin Wei. Welcome to my YouTube channel. I have a lot of plant growing series on my channel. Please check those out. But this is a video about exterminating mosquito larvae with 3% hydrogen peroxide. As you can see, there are some writhing in there right now. So I never had this problem before, but I was always worried about vermin taking a hold in there due to the rich nutrient runoff. Turns out that mosquito larvae eat the microorganisms that grow from such nutrient runoff and they filter it into their mouth parts and keep growing and growing. So the first thing I did before this clip, between this clip and the previous clip, was I siphoned away using a manual siphon pump all of the wastewater in there so that's why it looks a lot better and the water level is much lower. I poured in a fraction of a hydrogen peroxide bottle. Let this be the beginning, T equals zero minutes. I'm not noticing that much of a reaction. This is very underwhelming. Not seeing any evidence of them dying yet. Although that was a used bottle, so maybe it wasn't as potent anymore. So at T equals 7 minutes, this is after I poured in another fractional bottle that contained, again, less than a liter of hydrogen peroxide at 3% concentration. Now these two used bottles may have lost some of their potency already, and I'm adding in a full new bottle that hasn't been opened before, so that's yet another liter going in there. That's close to almost two liters. And by now, whatever water was in there in the water collection tray after I siphoned away as much as I could is now um, diluted with hydrogen peroxide. So the hydrogen peroxide concentration should be at least above 2% at this point. And we're noticing a lot of floating dead ones, but again, I don't know if those came out of the watering tray or what, but this seems like fewer live ones than we had in the beginning of this video, so that's a good sign. But would you really be that convinced by a supposed insecticide that did this and still had all these bugs thrashing around after seven minutes? After all, most insecticides that you use, chemical ones, they kill almost immediately, stop bugs in their tracks. So at T equals 10 minutes, I decided to pour in a fourth bottle that contains yet another liter. It does look like there is some killing action, but it seems like some have resistance. Maybe those are new mosquito larvae that swam out of the tray on the other side. There's an opening in the watering tray built into this pot on the other side. I had to spin the orientation of the pot around early in this plant growing series to get the vines to go the right way towards the sun. And I'm also going to pour some direct hydrogen peroxide, 3%, in that patch where I poured some of the wastewater from the rubber tubing of the siphon pump after I was done using it, just in case that area has mosquito larvae in it now, and there's enough moisture or sitting water somewhere in there to enable them to grow. It's a possibility. Although, I think they need a standing pool of water, not just really wet dirt. So you can see all this thrashing still. This is not very convincing insecticide action. So for many online recipes, they do something like add one teaspoon or tablespoon or two to a liter or gallon. That seems very dilute to me. So if 3% only manages to do this after 10 minutes, can you imagine what would happen if you follow one of those online recipes and use that to water your garden or add that to water such as this. So at T equals 15 minutes, I've added a fifth bottle in between this clip and the previous one. So that's almost a gallon 
almost four liters, slightly under it. And I'm not noticing complete cessation of thrashing, which is their mode of locomotion essentially. So I'm not really that convinced. And later on I siphon all the hydrogen peroxide that you see here, almost a gallon, and replaced everything with fresh tap water because now everything looks gross. So at exactly 24 hours later, it, that was a pure coincidence by the way, everything seems to have died. So was it the hydrogen peroxide that they were sitting in for several minutes, 15 minutes total, or was it the chlorine, chloramine that is in tap water? You know, so you can see all these washed up dead larvae or the water level was once higher so I have siphoned it away twice you know once when the water was rancid and once after all that hydrogen peroxide so I think you'll have to draw your own conclusions I wouldn't say this one-off experiment was very conclusive thanks for watching and please chime in with your two cents in the comments section so these cuttings have never looked better and on day 309, I pruned an offshoot far over the balcony rail. It was hanging very low. I don't want this stuff growing to the second floor. And I accidentally cut off this flower in the process, not knowing it was attached because I can't see over the rail, not with the table and all. It's a very beautiful flower. It's got an exquisite structure. It's got these thin, curled, rice noodle-looking appendages um, sticking out in all directions. I wonder how many there are probably a few hundred, maybe 360 isn't a far off guess. So it's got these giant stamens and anthers and whatnot. On day 310, there was this other flower that I saw on day 309 that looked just as beautiful, but it was in the shade. So I didn't get any good video footage of that, but it looks like that now, which is a great disappointment. I realized that these flowers only last for one day. So they're the exact opposite of orchids but maybe not losing out in beauty in comparison. And the flower I just showed you in the previous clip, it looks like that on day 310, so it's gone. And it looks like a fruit could have developed if everything was still attached, but it won't, of course. So there are no other flowers to show you, but I just wanted to show you that because it's a key milestone in this plant growing series. And because I had to deal with that mosquito infestation, it was time to fertilize again. I used two heaping scoops of miracle Grow Flower Boost. At this juncture, fertilization is critical. I washed out the soil with so much tap water after a hydrogen peroxide treatment to get rid of all the mosquito larvae. You can see those cuttings are wilted again. So that's how they are. They can't compete with the main vine. And once the sun hits everything, they droop like that. So I've done the best I can and hopefully I'll get a lot more flowers in the coming days and I'll have a lot more footage to show you and eventually hopefully these can self-fertilize and become passion fruits. So I can't wait for that. Thanks for watching this update. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel and like my Facebook page as well. Alright, it's day 314. It's 2017, August 12th. I'm giving you the date to give you a sense of seasonality with regards to what's going on in the series. It's a good time to be flowering and fruiting, hopefully, because it's hot. It's August, which is the hottest month in San Diego County in general. So I had to do a lot of fertilization after dealing with that mosquito larvae infestation shown in the last episode. And there's a standalone video on how I dealt with mosquito larvae with 3% hydrogen peroxide. In any case, I flushed away after flood watering the nutrients out of the soil many times. So on day 315, the next day, I solved all of these problems with dragging and sagging on the ground and against the wall with a piece of string. I don't know why I didn't do this much earlier, but imagine all these offshoots will be a lot more productive they have access to the late afternoon dusk sun every day now well going forward at least and that makes the vine as a whole a lot more productive it also makes all these flowers which are very beautiful visible to the hummingbird that keeps coming by 
and other pollinators such as bees. I know they've been checking out the California goldenrod blooms and feeding there every day, at least the bees have. So this is a very exquisitely beautiful flower. The design is wonderful. It's unlike anything I've ever seen. This flower bud is huge. It's waiting to burst forth. It's very big shame that these flowers only last for one day. So going back to what I was discussing earlier after the mosquito larvae infestation and the ensuing flush out of all the nutrients, I added at least six scoops of miracle Grow Flower Boost, which I deem very fitting for this period, and also two scoops of the generic one, which is more for vegetative general growth. And I crushed three generic men's health multivitamins and scatter those into the debris on top of the pot, the compost. So after that, I did some limited watering from the top and I added water from the bottom. I've been keeping the watering tray, that white bin, full every day. I used to let it go dry sometimes or run all the way down to the line of the pot's built-in watering tray. And that's obviously not good. Everything starts sagging. Even these leaves, after a day or two, after the fix where I tied everything up to that uh, porch light, there are still some leaves that are saggy or droopy looking. Imagine that a lot of these lost function and just weren't adequately supplied by the plant because they really had no function sitting in the darkness down there. And there have been actually a lot of flower buds shed, very small ones, these three pseudo leaves that you see at the base of each one. I mean those things shed whenever there's inadequate nutrition. It's just something all these vines do if they're not getting enough of the macronutrients, micronutrients they need. So that's basically it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed all the aesthetics. Thanks for watching and please stay tuned. All right it's day 318 of this growing passion fruit from seed series. I tried manually pollinating with a fingertip and a brush. I just watched the first YouTube video in a generic search on how to pollinate passion fruit flowers manually. So this string is working out really well. Just one piece of string and I have everything going upwards and really harvesting this late afternoon dusk sun every day. It's making the vine a lot more productive. These are for the most part the healthiest leaves aside from the ones uh, directly behind the rail. Those are even bigger, but they're older. These are all new growth. I don't know what those ants are doing. They're really capitalizing on this plant and loving my balcony. So for the flower anatomy, there are five anthers that spin around freely when you touch them. Kind of worried that they're going to break off because obviously they're not mechanical parts. So I'm getting the pollen from the undersides of those free spinning anthers and I think one of the stigmas here is, is broken off of its style. So flower anatomy is complicated. It's one of those things you uh, might learn in college biology or high school biology. Then you'll just forget and look it up every few years, only if you have a reason to. But basically, yeah, there's five anthers, uh, three stigmas. Everything's from the underside. The ants do nothing to help pollinate these. As far as I can tell, they just want to drink nectar and go to the extra floral nectaries and mooch off um, my fruits of my labor and the plant obviously. So I don't think this brush really did anything because in the days after the flowers, the ovule is that thing in the middle or the ovary if you want to call it that. It's the round structure that's going to become the fruit if the stigmas become pollinated which in my case I think none of them can but based on my honeydew experience four years ago if the plant's not doing well for whatever reason or doesn't have enough nutrition uh, fertilizer or sunlight leaves it's not going to proceed to the fruiting stage so all these flowers just fell off and bear in mind they only stay open for one day so you basically have to check every single day so it's day 336, a few weeks later, and I was watering from the top. I had fertilized with four scoops of miracle Grow. I have a suspicion, 
I think that ant's carrying a egg for its species. I haven't seen a queen. Probably wouldn't know what a queen looks like for this species. Not that familiar. I don't even know what this ant species is. They're harmless. They don't bite. They just mooch off the extra floral nectaries of this plant. Water is very brackish despite me doing a complete flush and two siphonings two days ago. So it's a lot of work. And I fertilize with four scoops of miracle Grow Flower Boost. It's obviously not toxic as many people believe because for such small animals any amount of toxic material would seep into their bodies and affect them immediately. They wouldn't be interested in this pot or alive if that were the case. So they have nowhere to go. They can't go into that effective moat of brackish water down there. Their only way in and out is through the trunk, the main stem of this vine. So I just wanted to keep you updated on the status of this series. It's definitely going on. I want to do some more flushes and siphon the waste away and fertilize again to nurse this plant back to health. I don't know if that will involve having to add hydrogen peroxide again to try to kill these ants, but I think hydrogen peroxide may oxidize and neutralize some of the reagents in the chemical fertilizer. So that's it. I don't have any fruits and I need more flowers. Alright, it's day 338. It's time to give this thing a hydrogen peroxide shower. At the time I thought it made a lot of sense as it would help disinfect everything and get some oxygen down there into the root ball. Although that's not my primary concern. There's been a lot of bug infestation. So this is on fast forward. You can see everything kind of forming waves up and down that's because the hydrogen peroxide reacts with things and releases oxygen bubbles and lots of water as well so the water's already there and the volume that I'm showering in it's the oxygen that's uh, expanding and moving everything around which in retrospect is not that great for the pot because it's disturbing the connections established between the roots the fine roots and the chunks of potting mix so you can see the whole thing just quaking and waffling around it's uh, kind of fun to look at so this is a very leisurely 10 minute episode in which I'll explain the thought process and the history of what happened to this passion fruit vine of mine over the last two months so if you've been following this passion fruit growing series I've had many flowers over the past few episodes and you can see actually a worm there on the very far right of this pot um, kind of wriggling around so that's another pest that I'll show you up close later on I don't know if it actually does anything I don't know what it's eating it looks like some uh, caterpillar or moth worm that might be eating just the debris down there and all the stuff that's rotting so that's very interesting I don't know where they came from I don't know if anything flew in here and laid eggs but there have been a lot of problems I thought I was gonna get fruit by now but it's late October at the end of this episode at this point it's still you know, mid-September in the footage and it's going to get cold soon well cold is a relative thing depending on where you live so it's day 343 as I mentioned earlier, as you saw, strange worms have visited my passion fruit pot and we'll get a very close look at those, two of those later. I didn't even notice it in the footage previously. But as you can see here, the foliage looks more yellow than it has in the past. And In the beginning of this plant growing series, I noted how robust and lush the foliage looked. Past the initial episode, the first hundred days, Everything got a dark green. It was a beautiful verdant appearance and the vine elongated and we got more and more leaves and more and more offshoots until it took over the entire balcony. So here's an example of one of these uh, caterpillars it looks like that comes out, some kind of worm, after I water a lot. So it's obviously living in the potting mix, which is very strange. So therefore maybe it's not a caterpillar. It doesn't eat the leaves nothing seems to eat these leaves actually it's just these uh, worms, uh, fungus gnats and other pests, ants that keep burrowing in so there was a point at which ants overrun this pot as they try to with other pots perhaps they're trying to establish a forward base or a new nest here but I keep disturbing it so it's not an ideal habitat for them and when I water everything just runs for the hills, uh, runs to high ground in this case to avoid drowning. 
So if you know what these caterpillars or worms are, uh, please let me know in the comments. I'd be very interested. So this is day 354. You can see the leaves are recovering. There are more of a nice green in here on the balcony. I tied everything up there. So I started spraying insecticide. There's no getting around it. I was worried by the general state of health of this vine. And it every started recovering. Everything started recovering, in fact. Um, not too long after I sprayed insecticide. So as you can see, they're in that uh, makeshift trash can consisting of an old cracked plastic pot that's empty. It's got a lot of leaves in there. So this thing has been shedding leaves. It's been becoming unsightly from the balcony outside. The exterior, if you look from the parking lot, it just doesn't look that great anymore. And as you can see here, it's sort of threadbare. So many of those healthy giant leaves have been lost. And you have new leaves coming out, but they're not entirely robust and healthy either. So a lot of this stuff just looks like it's burned at the edges, a little yellowing. We've lost so many, so many leaves. Uh, some of those just fall down. Most of them I just pluck away. And I'm very surprised to notice that there's a new seedling there. So these seeds have stayed viable in the potting mix for over a year. That's astonishing. And they chose now to erupt, at least this one has. As you may remember from earlier in the series, I had two seedlings and two cuttings. And I just left them there for a long time until conditions went bad and the water is inexplicably murkier than it has ever been. It doesn't really smell, but it looks really nasty. So it's day 364. I did a second insecticide spraying at night, uh, coinciding with this uh, update, this footage. And as you can see, the vine is making a recovery. It obviously prefers the shade because that's where the foliage is by far the most robust. And what I'm not showing here is just the tons and tons of little flower primordia and other things that just look burned and shrivel up and fall down to the balcony floor. So I have to keep vacuuming those every once in a while because there's so many you know, parts that just fall down there. So the vine isn't ready to uh, flower again, much less fruit. And it just has this very spindly, unsightly appearance. Remember how dark green and lush this area of the balcony used to look on the rail? So as you can clearly see, it just doesn't like direct sun. And this isn't even full sun. It's just afternoon sun after uh, the sun passes over the building sometime around noon, depending on the season. So I'm in a huge pickle here. I don't know if I should just end the series or whatnot. But I decided to carry on for a while, otherwise you wouldn't see the rest of this episode, and I would just have this labeled as the finale. So there are clumps of green moss in there. I stopped dumping on scoops of uh, fertilizer in crystalline form on top. I did uh, fertilize with a squirt bottle with some dissolved uh, fertilizer and sometimes in the shower can, but I really went easy on that stuff because... I felt like at this juncture it wasn't really making a huge difference or helping. So it's day 392. I did a third insecticide spraying at night. So this coincides with the current time at the end of uh, October. And as you can see, what I've tied up there has grown to a huge extent. It's threatening to crowd out lots of space on the balcony. Very reminiscent of my sweet Annie plant. So this vine it's not really going anywhere. I mean, it's recovering, and this area is much thicker, but it's not um, flowering. It's not flowering anytime soon, probably. So what I want to do here is what I've done with the rest of my plants. Uh, those of you who prefer a more natural approach will love this. Um, I'm removing all of this top layer compost. Um, you can see how hard it is to... Uh, wait for that stuff to rot away, those hollow stems and whatnot. So just imagine uh, most of the potting mix is made of wood chips and sphagnum peat moss. That stuff takes forever to break down. Wood is one of the hardest things in nature to break down. So I'm getting rid of all the debris on the top. I'm surprised that there are now two seedlings and they've done well. Uh, one is smaller than the other, but that came out later anyway. So what I did with my other plants before this is I 
got a bag of soil that I dug up from the outside, from the surface, you know, just the top few centimeters, uh, top two inches maybe, I took a trowel and got a lot of wild dirt from outside. I live in North County, San Diego, and this is very typical of the dirt you'll find. And what I'm hoping to do here is to form a fine seal on top, which will do many things that will have a wild flora in terms of microbes seep into there and hopefully help digest the potting mix, which is very hard to digest. And it forms a seal because it's very fine, which will prevent fungus gnats and so on. It'll prevent a lot of evaporation, which occurs with germinating things. That's why my series have been so slow to get started, because I'm using sterilized potting mix. Uh, it doesn't have the microbes that it would need to break down. The alternative would be just have uh, plant parasites destroy everything immediately, like spider mites and so on. So by doing this, I haven't covered all of my pots, and it would take 50 pounds per backpack of soil just to fill up a medium-sized pot that's not even this size. It's a lot of work, but um, I intend to get more wild dirt gradually. It doesn't need to be a lot, it just needs to be an amount that can supplement my potting mix and counteract all the negative effects that potting mix has on uh, nascent plant development, such as these two germinating seedlings. I guarantee they're going to do way better from this point on. And with the microbes that I bought in from the wild, uh, hopefully I can even get some mushrooms like back in the day with my ginger series. All right, it's day 462 of this series. As you can see, there's a light housing and an incandescent light bulb. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, you can see that from here. That's on my balcony. That's my balcony light. And the apartment complex has notified me that that has to go. They're going to send somebody to change not only the light bulb to an LED bulb, but also the housing as well. So this is all tied to that light, which is coming out of the wall with a piece of string. Remember I did that a few months ago, so I figured I would use this chance to prune the rest of this away because at this point in the year, it's January 2018, all that foliage that's tied to the light between that and the railing gets nothing per day. The sun falls behind that hill in the background that you've seen many, many times at 3.30 p.m. And it really doesn't hit this balcony and these pots and plants you see before until maybe 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So all that uh, foliage that used to be on the vines running along the rails, that has been shedding at a pretty steady rate. And for the last few months, it's just made a big mess. I have to constantly generate all this trash and collect all of these fallen leaves manually and as you can see there's a lot of dirt on the balcony floor as well because I brought in a few bags of California wild hill dirt that I applied to the top of the potting mix for all my plants and I passed that through metal kitchen sieve and that dusting action to get rid of all the pebbles that occurred naturally in the dirt that I scooped up that generated that fine dust that landed on everything and it was a uh, real bear to clean that all off. So it's been a lot of work and here I am doing yet more work to prune all of this away and make way for the person who's going to install this in a few days, the new light housing and light bulb. But I deem it necessary at this point. I think this foliage, although it looked pretty good in the beginning of this video, it's not productive. It doesn't get any sunlight and there's a lot of theories on how you should just prune away foliage that's no longer productive in order to foster new growth uh, changes in the plant and also just get rid of dead weight and I think that's what all of this is at this point. I know it's a shade plant it doesn't really like being in direct sunlight. As you can see the foliage here looks a lot healthier than what's uh, beyond the rails so that's something we've definitely learned from the beginning. It's not a full sun plant. And it's winter, so I'm not going to get flowers again or fruits anytime soon. Not when the days are so short and it's 
typically cold, although I'll show you the weather later on. In this video, it's not cold uh, compared to previous years or normal years. So I'm going to get rid of all of this, and you'll see uh, how far I'll go by the end of this video. But it generates a lot of biomass, and uh, make no mistake, I don't enjoy cutting out my plants like this, but out of necessity, I feel like I have to because I have no space and these vines are blocking all the sunlight from my other plants as well. So there's no real purpose here. I'm thinking in 2018 I'm going to go small and compact and maybe just not have all these huge pots um, that are 14, 15 inches in diameter at the mouth because that just takes way too much dirt and as you've seen with many of my plant series I had a tendency this year well 2017 actually to overwater and I think that was the reason most of my plants were not looking so hot so I'm thinking smaller volume of soil might do some wonders and you can see the remaining remnants of all these vine offshoots are tied to the piece of string I'm just gonna cut that stuff because it's easy to tie things like that up to a high point, but it's not easy to reach up there and untie them with your hands, especially not while you're holding a cell phone camera with your other hand. So I'm just going to do the cutting, and that'll be it. Uh, the maintenance guy will be able to come in and do the installation. So my balcony should be totally cleared up long before that guy arrives, and I'll feel a lot better for having gotten rid of all this dead weight though so it's uh it's quite a chore i'll have to do a lot of cleanup afterwards so as i was saying i want to consider other methods for 2018 that are less labor intensive i definitely won't grow vines although i'm going to keep this one uh, i'm going to prune it and basically have it regrow and hopefully something good can happen in 2018 and I plan on moving within a few months so between now and then uh, many things can happen but I don't want this vine to get in the way more than it already has so I might start another plant series experiment um, but I'm gonna keep the plants that I have uh, right now although if I get busy with a move and whatnot I it may be very disruptive for this channel. I might not uh, carry everything through or you know, be able to start too much new work. So these old, older vines that are responsible for well, older sections of vine that are transporting water and nutrients to and from all the stuff that I just cut before now lay here in a pile and I'm going to have to get rid of that too. It's kind of difficult to hold the camera with one hand and uh, do all this with the other hand. But I just wanted to show you, um, you know, all the busy work that goes into this as I talk about my plans for 2018. So I have a pineapple series that's doing okay. Uh, I got a new water distiller that distills water the same volume in just four and a half hours, and it's way cheaper than what those things cost uh, I don't know how many years ago I had one maybe you know eight or nine years ago anyway uh, it's produced a lot of water and because of that I had a lot of um, distilled water that I could use on my plants um, in conjunction with all that wild dirt I was thinking if it's not full of chlorine or chloramine it, it wouldn't kill the bacteria but I think I ended up overwatering many of my plants at the end of 2017 that's why so my series weren't doing too hot. So for the last two weeks or so, I've laid off on that. And other people have pointed out that it's possibly overwatering as well in the comments uh, from my last video or two. So I think I think that's what it is. It's a valid thing to point out. So I've stopped watering in the last two weeks for all my plants. I want to give everything a chance to dry out. As I've said many times before, all that potting mix within the pots is very hygroscopic. It holds on to water forever and ever. So if you have pots that don't have anything growing in them, and thus no root system to dry out the soil, stuff in there can stay wet for 
up to a year I found and it just keeps generating fungus gnats during that time so for the passion fruit vine I think it's actually been longer since I've watered meaningfully because I noticed that this thing wasn't as thirsty as it had been in the past. You can see all these leaves, they just fall everywhere and make a huge mess. And I'm going to have to vacuum afterwards and maybe wash off the balcony floor with some hot water. So that's what's left. You know, it looks kind of sad now. The foliage has steadily been sprouting over the last few weeks and months, um, ever since prime time. And I'm sure there's still plenty of moisture inside that pot. So I don't think I need to water for a really long time. When you cut these vines, you don't see anything uh, weeping out of the wounds as you would for many other plants that have uh, you know, sap or very high turgor pressure. So that just sends all the water and nutrients basically uh, beating out of the wounds. This, when you cut all the vine offshoots, it just looks dry and mostly white and uh, maybe a little spongiform in texture inside. So I'm pulling out all these wild grass seedlings uh, and whatever other weeds that were brought in with the California wild dirt. But yeah, it's, uh, it's a welcome sight to have all this empty space and see the Joshua tree not be choked anymore by all those tendrils and encroaching leaves that were just blocking away the the sun. So I think with the lack of watering everything should improve. It is winter time after all and without my pots getting more than say two hours, two and a half hours of direct sun, a very angled winter time weak sun every day, um, I don't think there's much evaporation going on. So as you can see that looks pretty disgusting. That's below the level of the watering tray it's got a lot of drowned ants in it and I'm just gonna finally be able to lift this pot up now that it's not tied to everything on the rail and wipe off the sides uh, clean out that nasty disgusting tub and um, you know wipe off the the glass table as well so it'll be a really nice site finally to have all that clean and since I won't be doing much watering for that passion fruit vine for quite a while I won't need to water to the point where I feel like I need that tub and have it submerged with uh, you know eight inches of water just as a precaution so this is the weather it's a screenshot of the Windows 10 weather app taken on the 7th of January 2018 so the weather has been very dry and it's been very warm very uncharacteristic of greater San Diego County area. I live in San Marcos and this is in Celsius for all of you who don't live in America. So that's to, just to give you an idea of how mild the weather has been. So it's day 469 and as I've shown you already this is all clean and there's the new light that they installed. It looks better. The LED light is more efficient and it's brighter than what it was before that incandescent bulb and they did that with all the parking lights too so the rails clean and finally we have a day with some more sun not just a, another gloomy typical winter day uh, there were two days of rain in that weather report that I just showed you and those were the first two days of rain that I recall in this winter it's been very very warm and dry so contrasting to the very wet winter of 2017 where we got 200 plus inches of rain in some areas of the northern Sierra Nevadas that's uh, jungle levels of rain so as you can see on this foliage it's grown a little bit these little black ants on my balcony are still sipping from these extra floral nectaries so I've devastated maybe a good 95% of their, or 90% at least, of their food supply on this balcony. I don't know if they're still trying to nest in this pot or not. But I was thinking I'm going to go small, and I'm going to have those uh, English horse trowel, you know, these metal cage things uh, that hold cocoa core pots, essentially, and just have them 
on the outside of the rail and that will easily double the amount of sun that any plants that I start new planting series in will get in the afternoon uh, basically maybe right afternoon instead of waiting until 1 or 2 or 3 p.m. before this uh, balcony gets any sun so I have uh, a lot of stuff going on but at the same time I think my YouTube channel won't be operating at a toward pace especially around I think May when I plan to do a move and I'm gonna clean all this out at some point and make it nice looking so um, that's it for this episode uh, thank you for watching and I look forward to producing some new content for 2018 alright it's day 475 of this growing passion fruit from seed series I intended for this series to go on for a second season and possibly bear some fruit but it doesn't look like it's gonna happen and as you can tell from the title of this episode it says finale so it's pretty much over so it's been in a continual struggle it's been spawning new leaves very often but shedding those leaves so these ones that I showed you just now with the white spots on them they just have this bleached appearance and they shed within a week or two so I don't know what the deal is can touch upon that more later but for now it's just making a lot of work I could use these leaves for compost as I did in the past but I don't think uh, lack of nutrients is the prime problem here so one of my viewers pointed me to a video that led me to another video because it was uh, covering the same nursery not far from where I live and the channel is called Gary's Best Gardening and it's a uh, quite an excellent resource it contains a lot of videos about the science behind soil and me having a scientific background myself I immediately identified with what he was talking about both in terms of um, in my experiences with potty mix and wild soil that I've brought in so to make a long story short soil is mostly minerals it's ground up rock powder caused by eons of erosion and it may contain organic content and some clay which is uh, both you know necessary and present almost everywhere in soils worldwide but that organic content is about less than one percent in nature on average and for farmers they could go a little higher and up the organic content of their soil that they're using to grow crops up to say 1.1 percent but that differs completely from what I've been using over the past five years which is miracle Grow potting mix if you follow my channel since 2013 you'll see that that's mostly what I've used save for one uh, melon series that I did indoors in 2014 where I lugged a backpack full of 50 pounds of wild California hill dirt from a construction site and used that to grow a vine indoors and eventually that got some mildew uh, but it did really well in the beginning the vines under even weak LED artificial lights I encourage you to go back and watch that series at least in the beginning kind of skim through it the leaves were just enormous and it was uh, really shocking but later on due to it being indoors it got this powdery mildew mold and it didn't really go anywhere uh, the lights I had weren't strong enough so I quit using wild dirt because it's so heavy just one big pot like this would weigh possibly 60 or 70 pounds I bet so as you can see here the stems are slowly getting bleached uh, the vascular tissue just turns like a spongy white um, from the cross sections and this is basically going nowhere so getting back to the soil I think I was on the right track actually with getting wild dirt and I tried doing so again in 2017 with many of these plant series such as uh, actually my mango uh, this uh, the Joshua tree for all of my plants actually in the latter half of 2017 I got some wild hill dirt and sifted out all the big pebbles and rocks and used that 
to sprinkle layer on top of my potting mix because all my plants were growing so slow they were getting off to really really slow starts and I think it's pretty much spot on for uh, other people to say that you know I sterilized the potting mix and that killed off all the beneficial microbes I agree I think that's what happened so I had to do that however to get rid of things like spider mites that come with potting mix when you buy new so after sterilizing and seeing the slow results I decided to go out and get some wild teal dirt sprinkle it in and I knew that that would reseed the potting mix with microbes but what I think actually ended up happening was it congealed with the potting mix at the top uh, maybe it's more fine and clay content or higher I mean and it would just form these plates um, these congealed plates that would be brittle and they would seal in the moisture into the potting mix so what I learned from this channel Gary's Best Gardening is that if plants aren't meant to grow in piles of dead plant matter and compost uh, more specifically potting mixes that are sold since the 60s are all basically wood chips and twigs a bark things like that aside from whatever else they put in it's made to be lightweight and very very absorbent and it's also a perfect medium for growing mushrooms if you watch some of my series in 2013 and on uh, I think I believe yeah my first year I had a lot of mushrooms growing in um, so that was without sterilizing the potting mix after sterilizing the potting mix and let's say 2016 2017 I never saw any mushrooms or spider mites again but I still had the occasional fungus gnat and that's not a problem these days perhaps due to the powerful insecticides that my apartment complex has sprayed around because I've noticed a lot of dead ants on this table and after a while there were just uh, no more bug problems so at this point you can see that the plant is clearly dead and it's easy to just say oh that's due to overwatering or root rot but remember for most of 2017 I could just water this thing in an unlimited fashion I moved it over here because I thought that the leaves were not fond of too much light remember in the latter half of 2017 the vines had extended all the way to this side of the balcony and the foliage here was always green and lush and doing pretty well so how come moving this whole pot over here didn't rescue it I think that's because by sprinkling in this new um, wild dirt as I had mentioned in one of my other recent episodes I basically seeded new microorganisms in there and combined with the new deep watering after a few weeks and months that really really accelerated the rate of decomposition as I've mentioned with some of my other pots I forgot which episode I said that it seems like the potting mix really broke down and become it became a sludge basically a black sludge so um, a lot of people have watched my videos lately and said uh, that's because you're just drowning your stuff you know you're letting it drown in a pool of water that's only because I had uh, thumbnail pictures for some of these videos showing the reflection of water on top because it takes so long for the water to percolate through the congealed layer of dirt and potting mix on the top as with my Joshua tree and whatnot but actually I haven't been watering that much there was a period of time from August I mean October 2017 maybe uh, there was a heat wave and then I was afraid of root rot and whatnot so I didn't water much and eventually for my mango pot for instance it was just so light it, it felt very very light to the touch and I dug in there and found out most of the potting mix was dry so I don't really think that's what's going on I think there's a lot of validity to what I saw on that other channel that basically compost is not meant to I mean potting mix here is not meant to last for say eight months or whatever amount of months that some of my recent series have gone on for before the plants mysteriously died um, Gary says that maybe in five months 
most potting mixes are just completely a rotten mess and that's toxic to the root system so if you're growing vegetables and flowers and things like that for the short term uh, in most parts of America or the world even in the northern hemisphere uh, the potting mix will be good for a season starting maybe late winter early spring people will buy some and then try to grow some flowers and vegetables and within five months it's a rotten mess that's toxic and then the root system dies so it's a a lot more complex than just saying you know, oh it's root rot you overwatered I basically think there's a lot of validity to saying that these potting mixes are not designed for long-term use and I've had a lot of success as well well maybe not a lot but I've had some plants that went on for you know two or three years so I don't think it's a complete failure of a medium I just think not every plant is suited to being grown in potting mix so in the future I'll definitely look to I'll grow my plants in smaller pots to reduce the overwatering potential but I think for soil medium where I can and where I can in terms of getting a new start I'll just use a mixture of sand and wild California hill dirt I think that'll do way better um, so I look forward to trying that in the future and if possible just fertilizing either using chemical fertilizer or having organic matter in a thin layer on the top that won't be enveloping the root system so that's the way things are intended to work in nature uh, rain or me watering from the top down that will cause the nutrients from the breakdown of said organic matter like dead leaves to percolate down into the mineral soil and clay so that's basically my thoughts on what happened here I think the addition of wild dirt and all that watering eventually just caused too much decomposition it attracted a lot of bugs as many people have said on my channel a rich soil will attract a lot of bugs and that's exactly what happened uh, before my apartment complex sprayed a lot of pesticides I actually sprayed some pesticides too because the bug problem was getting out of control so that's what the root system looks like it doesn't look like it's completely dead but the shoot system clearly was nearly completely dead. So that's it folks. Please come back to my YouTube channel in the future for more plant growing series.